baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Fathers are the most ordinary men, turned by love into heroes, adventurers, storytellers, and singers of songs. But see, my father has never been an ordinary man. To me, you see, he's always been a hero in my eyes. Some people you look up to no matter how tall you grow. Uh, my father has never told me how to live. He lived and he let me watch him do it. And by watching him, I saw what God wanted me to be and what God had called me to be. My pastor and my father, Talmadge French. He is a writer of many works, but one that you probably have heard of the most common is our God is One an early interracial oneness Pentecostalism. He also has a oneness track and a baptism in Jesus name track that he has authored and is for sale as well. He has always been a shining light and example, not only in the world of academics, but across the Pentecostal movement. And I am so incredibly honored to have him on the podcast today. In the interview, we talk about everything from academics to pastoring, to ministry, to a new book that he's working on. That All right, I am here with my father and my pastor, Talmadge French. Dad, how are you doing today? Very good. Good to be here. <laughs> and I'm very honored. Uh, so uh, I want to kind of jump into some questions here. And these questions are a mix of questions I wanted to ask. And we also got a, a couple questions from Facebook that I wanted to to mix in because when people heard I was going to be interviewing you, they had some some questions that they would like to ask. Okay. So we're just going to kind of weave those in. Okay. So when did you first feel a call to preach on your life? And could you include in that period in your life your conversion from Trinitarianism to oneness Pentecostalism? Because I know not everybody knows that side of your story, especially the man who wrote Our God is One, I know they're going to be very interested in that part of your story. Okay, well I was uh, introduced to the faith uh, through the Assemblies of God and uh, I received the Holy Ghost in the what is known as the Church of God and lived in Arkansas at the time. So I grew up with my roots in the Church of God but then later was a member of an Assemblies of God church. And of course, they're both uh, strong Pentecostal Trinitarian right. denominations. Right. But <clears throat> I was uh, first uh, called to preach when I was 16. Oh, wow. And uh, so I was a young uh, Trinitarian faithful Pentecostal right. uh, when I first felt the call to preach and actually uh, soon after that, I began to wrestle with, uh, seriously wrestle with the implications of the oneness mm. teaching and baptism. And, uh, you know, first of all, did I have to really be baptized? Did it really matter that much? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I in, ended up preaching my first sermon when I was 16. Oh, okay. And I preached my first message from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout that was my first message and i was scared to death there were about oh, wow. 300 people there 
and uh, and I've been preaching ever since. But you know, there's another side of me not just preaching, and that's I've got sort of an academic uh, life as oh, well. Oh, I didn't know that. And, that's <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so the so the battle began all the way back then. Now, as far as uh, my conversion, I was uh, my first introduction to the oneness people or the oneness of God never really I had never met a oneness person but uh, I heard a broadcast by the United Pentecostal Church on the radio it was called Harvest Time okay. they no longer call it Harvest Time but I was with my pastor at a youth rally coming home and I heard Harvest Time for the first time and Harvest Time opened the door for me to be asking questions and and uh, after about three years a little over three years of back and forth wrestling with should I really be baptized and should I go to a oneness church I ended right. up embracing the oneness wow that's amazing so that's how it started well I am so thankful that you did because I know that your ministry has touched so many people and uh, I never realized how well known your ministry was until I was older and I started traveling a lot and then everybody uh, started knowing me as Talmadge French's son, and then I realized that uh, how well known you were across the movement. Uh, when God called you to preach, was it a singular moment or was it a series of events? Uh, well, I was sort of a shy young person, and mm -hmm. so it took lots of events to. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, I thought it was somebody else. The Lord was talking to somebody behind me or something. I was at a youth camp, a um, a church of god youth camp and the lord spoke to me very very clearly at that camp and i knew i was going to preach and i also knew that i was too shy and uh backward i was from a broken home and there were a lot of things that uh were going on in my life that i just thought well i'm not capable of doing all of that and then the lord let me know that he was going to take care of all of it that's awesome thank you for sharing that with us now we're sitting here in apostolic tabernacle in south atlanta and you have served in this city for the last eight years i cannot believe it's been eight, eight years, eight years right. um, but we're seeing revival in our city in our church in our youth group in our sunday school classes uh, would you share with us how god called you to atlanta well eight years ago uh, i was preaching in georgia I knew I was about to finish my PhD, and so uh, I was uh, very close to uh, the Coles mm -hmm. and had preached in Georgia and Georgia camp a few times. And uh, Brother Cole was uh, in his 80s. He is the founder of the church and had this beautiful building over here on Terra. And he uh, approached me while I was preaching in the area and actually had come here to preach they they had about uh, well just basically a handful of people uh and uh, very faithful loyal people and this beautiful right. building and of course brother mm -hmm. cole's a, a uh, one of the great men of god and yeah. he took me to dinner which i knew something was up when he did that and he said uh the lord has told me you're you're to take this church wow. so i said i he hasn't told me that yeah. i was stunned and uh i was gonna have to go back to england and finish uh, and defend my, my my phd work on on the early history of the oneness movement mm -hmm. and a, a number of things and i i knew that when i finished that i would end up pastoring because i'd already uh decided i wouldn't be involved in uh, Bible school programs I was going to pastor from then on but uh, the Lord after a while the Lord I began to pray and fast and the Lord said you you're going to Jonesboro and wow. so here we are and ever since we've had revival we've gone from that uh, wonderful handful of faithful uh, original saints that Brother Cole had and now we're we're averaging between 250 and 300 on a fairly yeah. consistent basis. And a lot of those are brand new. Of course, they're all brand new, but, yeah. but uh, it's uh, it's uh, maturing and growing in the churches in revival. Yeah, it's been amazing. Uh, it's getting to where our uh, Sunday school classrooms are full and we're 
almost having somewhat of a space issue, which is a great, uh, incredible problem. Right. So I'm excited. I thank God that um, a lot of people ask, you know, because the, the whole French family ended up here. But when you listen to our individual stories, it's like God specifically called each one of us here to Atlanta. It's really yeah. neat. It's really neat how, how that happened. Now, you are widely known for your career in acad academia and, and known across the movement uh, as the apostolic scholar and your master's degree and PhD led to books like Our God is One, Early Interracial Oneness Pentecostalism. And I've always respected, and I know other people have as well, uh, how your faith has never wavered throughout your academic endeavors. And in the world of academia, tell can you tell us, did your experience with professors with different beliefs ever challenge your faith as a Pentecostal? Because I know that those are very intense environments, and I know that there's a lot of very uh, brilliant people involved that have different opinions about Scripture. Uh, what was that like for you? Did it ever challenge you? Well, the answer is definitely yes, that many times my faith was challenged my uh I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to academics and mm -hmm. so i was studying latin when i was 14 and was accepted for latin studies uh, at a university when i was still in high school and so i began an ancient language pursuit mm -hmm. when i was very young i was still trinitarian and so i began to look around at what i was going to do and i had to choose between basketball and <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I had to make a Between choice. Your scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did have a scholarship for ancient language because of my Latin studies. And so it I was, was not a basketball scholarship. It was not. Ba I know All that's right. going to stun All many right. people, but um, I became uh, involved in ancient language. I found that that was a very uh, good subject for me. And then I began to realize more and more, even though I was still Trinitarian, that I could defend the faith if I. Uh, got into ancient language and so uh, that process uh, goes hand in hand with me taking steps to try well I, I begin to try to def uh, defend the Trinity that was my first step that oh, wow. the Trinity was uh, was true there's no way that these oneness people were correct um, I'd heard harvest time and and uh, I, I began to realize if I didn't push away from it I was going to become a oneness person so I, I became pretty adamant that the Trinity had to be true and I had a whole list of reasons I gave papers at the uh, at college and different things so um, eventually though I convinced myself that there the oneness was true and I began to look at the Trinitarian arguments and said the, these these arguments are not uh, they're not clear or they're based on uh, things that are not solid and so I began to worry that I was losing my my Trinitarian faith eventually of course I <clears throat> I ended up getting a my ancient language degree at Wheaton College, which is a premier evangelical university in Chicago, started a UPC church there. And then uh, by that time, uh, I became sort of a target because I was, all my Trinitarian friends were like, how, how could you do that? How could you walk away from the Trinity and wow. become a, a all, and say things like, well, you know too much or, you know, whatever. And in their minds, people that knew things wouldn't turn to the oneness. And I said, well, then you don't know many oneness people because yeah. the oneness movement is growing. Mm -hmm. Most people, uh, especially Trinitarians, are unaware of the, uh, a lot of my research through the years has opened the eyes of a lot of certainly AGs and Church of God types. They've seen that the oneness movement is, is in fact, uh, one of the fastest growing Pentecostal segments right. of the entire movement, and uh, it's it, it's changed some some minds. Yeah. So um, I think there's always been a struggle in in my personal life between uh, academics and preaching, and preaching always wins out. But because I'm, uh, I guess I would call it an academic heart. Um, 
I've always pursued my education and continued preaching. There's never been a time that I was at the university that I wasn't also pastoring or full time in the right. in the ministry. Yes, sir. and so even though I've earned uh, three or four degrees during that entire process, I ended my uh, academic career in terms of university life in 2011. I was almost 100 years old, so. I had then, of course, my PhD, which was like a crowning achievement for me because yeah. I'd been spending most of my academic life defending the oneness movement. And then Trinitarian friends would uh, would be up in arms that I was using uh, ancient language and exegesis to try to defend the oneness. But, I, of course, I'm still convinced that the Bible teaches the oneness of God. People were baptized in Jesus' name, and yeah. that God is moving in the apostolic church. That's what He's. That's what He intended for people to be as apostolic. Man, that's that is wonderful. Now, as far as the books, mm -hmm. all right, um, we've uh, we've actually published four separate things and working on a, a fifth. Hopefully, before the Lord comes, I'll finish this fifth project. I have two small projects that are that have sold literally <laughs> tens of thousands yeah uh and uh they're they're what i sometimes call booklets and they one is on baptism the other's on the godhead and then um i've written both of my my masters was published and it was called our god is one mm -hmm. i did that at wheaton college where billy graham uh went and of course it's uh, a very well-known university mm -hmm. and then i ended up in england at the university of birmingham to write about the early oneness, Azusa, how oneness came out of Azusa, how how it became a phenomenon of growth, and we called that early interracial oneness Pentecostalism, and that book has sold thousands. So yeah. Yeah. altogether, we're right at 150,000, pretty close to 150,000 wow. copies of the booklets and the book. Uh, Our God is One was first, and. Uh, so almost all of this has been an attempt to either explain, I see my mission, my calling academically to help Trinitarians understand who we are and to see us for what we really are, not for what people tell them we are. And most of the, my work does that, but also to defend the oneness message. And so in my final work, or it may not be final, but it, I think it'll be my final work or my final major work because it's going to be like a PhD level project on the wow. on the Bible, how the Bible teaches uh, not just how it teaches the oneness, but also a defense of the Bible because the great battle of the of the end time church and even among apostolics is oh, going goodness. to be the Bible. Yeah. People who say the Bible is full of errors and so on. I'm going to spend the rest of my life. Uh, writing at a at a deep level a defense of an inerrant Bible. Wow. Well, that that answers one of the questions I wanted to to ask you about. Are you writing uh, any new books or in, a new book or new books? But uh, well, you, you do know now that people have heard that they're going to be, <laughs> uh, you're going to be getting emails galore. When can I expect? This well, I think work? about twenty thirty is my my goal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, hoping uh, by the time I'm one hundred, no, <laughs> by the time I'm a hundred, I hope to have it published. Uh, wow. it, because it's really quite a, since I'm a uh, <clears throat> my my academic studies, I have an ancient degree. A language ancient language degree mm -hmm. from Wheaton College and uh, so now I'm into my my seventh language that I've either you know wow. worked with or I'm or I've studied to some degree so that you know touches on Aramaic I've, of course I had Hebrew and I teach Hebrew and I teach Greek so this to me allows me to uh, uh, de defend uh, through exegesis, which is basically that just basically means explain the actual words of scripture from the original text. But of course, the, the, the another layer of that whole problem is that we now are in an age where people question the Bible and say mm -hmm. the Greek text is of faulty or God didn't preserve it. And so you have to go to that 
uh, which is now called textual criticism. So these are things that uh, you don't preach that from a pulpit, but it's certainly something that's uh, been in 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 my sights for many years. But yeah. now that I've completed my what I think of as the history of the Pentecostal movement, at least up through uh, you know at least up through 1930, the my last book from uh, England is an in depth look at how the movement became interracial and international wow. and therefore basically became even though it was completely despised by trinitarians mm -hmm. it became this dynamite movement wow and what i see happening now in the movement is that people uh there are those in the movement who are moving uh, uh away from original positions and taking a not so subtle shift and uh we need to help them to get on solid footing. Yeah. And we also need to help in time revival take place. Amen. I'm, I'm so excited that this book is going to happen because uh, that's, that's something that, that I face a lot as, as the younger generation with, with people you know, saying that there's certain errors in the Bible or certain things cannot be trusted in the Bible. And so I know, speaking from the younger generation, that it, we're going to be very thankful for that resource once it is available to us. So I thank God for that. Now, <clears throat> I went to Facebook and I asked, uh, I asked the question, if you could sit with Dr. Talmadge French for coffee and a podcast interview, what questions would you ask him? I had a feeling people would love to have this opportunity to sit with you. And I felt, you know what, I'm blessed to have this opportunity. And uh, there was a lot of questions submitted. So thank you all for submitting those. Um, but the number one question I saw that I told them I would ask is, what are your Bible study patterns when diving into scripture and what tools do you use to explore the text? This was the number one question that people wanted to hear from you specifically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, obviously I approach scripture uh, very academically, but with uh, you know heart of a believer. So I'm not a critic of the Bible. I'm a believer, but I approach it from the standpoint of language skill. Uh, and I try to help others to find their way into understanding the Bible better by understanding the Bible languages better. Uh, and then secondly, the word that I would use is hermeneutics, that how to interpret scripture has to become a uh, forefront of our, of our plan to uh, studying the Bible. And uh, to me, it's exciting. What, one yeah. of the most, uh, as a former Trinitarian, which seems so long ago, I don't talk about it a lot, but former Trinitarian, now oneness, um, I'm, I'm <clears throat> two things happened when I first uh, became, uh, earned my PhD, my, the Assembly of God contacted me to come to the seminary, the Assembly of God seminary, and explain, not just talk about it, but spend an entire day the seminary rescheduled itself so that I could teach four classes wow. and address the faculty of the Assemblies of God. And all around the basic question, there were, there were other questions, but the basic fundamental question was, why in the world did you get rebaptized and why did you become oneness? So I spent wow. all day long there. It was one of the most intimidating. Mm. Now, before that, I had been invited to a University of Assembly of God. Uh, I, I would call him sort of a cult hunter wannabe. Okay. He was Assembly of God, and I knew him, of course. Uh, but uh, he, what he was really trying to do was uh, make me look bad. Okay. So he had me come in, and, and I wrote a paper defending... Uh, Jesus name baptism and the Greek text and that's gone all over the world. That's something I've never published, but it's it uh, at least I mean it, There's no telling how many people have just that paper alone yeah, And and I have several works like that that it could end up being published But we're we just let them get out into the cyberspace, but mm -hmm. So he had me come to a, a, a University and there was a crowd there 
And then he began to call uh, the oneness movement a cult and so on. And and it just grieved me. You know, I ended up tears just running down my face. And and so I got up and, and I said to him, I said, now you've invited me here and, and you you told me it wasn't going to be like this. I said, all these people expecting a paper on Jesus' name baptism. He had introduced me by saying that because I had left the assemblies of God, I was going, that hell was going to be hotter for me than anybody else. Oh and I was like, well, that, that's a new theology. The I mean, well, <laughs> besides being a very weird introduction, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just how uh, uh, how troubled he was yeah. that that people would become oneness. Well, then a few years later, I'm invited right into the Assemblies of God to teach wow. and uh, and interact with them, took a Greek Bible and just taught their seminary students for hours. Now, whether or not it changed any minds, I, I do know the one thing that did happen because I got letters and letters and people talking about it sure. was that it changed their opinion oh, wow. about who oneness people are. Mm -hmm. They had the idea that oneness people were just sort of bumpkins and and uh, and, and that perception is completely false. And so and many of them said, you're the, really the first oneness person we've ever met oh, wow. or we've ever seen in this light. And so uh, I think that using the tools available to us, we don't have to be ignorant. I mean, if yeah. we if we have an education, we should use it, right. but we shouldn't let our education use us. And oh, that's wow. one of the dangers that that's we're good. seeing in our movement. We have to be very, very careful. And so... Um, that, that's uh, that's a beginning point for yeah, how, how I go about. Uh, I know studies. you could go into to depth with that. Um, and the kind of the second part to that question that was included was <clears throat> how does being well versed in Greek and Hebrew help you better understand the depth of the Bible? Well, I would say an en enormously because knowing the original language allows you to answer questions for example let's say someone says well that shouldn't be in the bible mm -hmm. right. well then you have to go back and look at the original and see well why are they challenging what this says here okay, yeah. so it helps you defend the bible at the very basic level and and people who are attacking the bible are the people who already know the biblical languages so if you don't know them you're going to have a difficult time defending the bible at that level right Right. And I think we're in an age where people are being deceived very quickly. Uh, we're seeing both evolution. Mm. We're seeing the whole climate change issue. People don't have to use logic anymore. They just basically act on emotion. They're not getting, they see fossils in the earth and they say, well, there's dinosaurs. There must be evolution. Mm. So that's the end of the discussion. But the truth is the Bible is true and the Bible declares itself to be true. And uh, so... Uh, to go back, go, get me back on track with your oh, original yeah, question. Yeah, so um, the, the Facebook questions wanted to know how knowing Greek oh, and how Hebrew, knowing, that's right, it, yeah. it helps you better understand the depth of Scripture. Well, almost every, mm -hmm. almost every sermon I preach, every, of course, everything I write is rooted in the study of the Scriptures in both uh, from modern uh, and you know the King James translation mm -hmm. right. and good scholars and how they translate it and then translating it myself looking at all the possibility you can't imagine how many Trinitarian scriptures when you have the Greek itself Mm -hmm. And you're looking at it, it, and they're claiming this is a Trinitarian statement. Right. But when you're looking at the original Greek, you find out that's not in a Trinitarian statement at all. Oh, wow. And and it helps to, and, and this is what I think the next generation of apostolics have got to do. Mm -hmm. They've got to write and defend, not, not go to Trinitarianism, but stay away from that and maintain because this movement is on the go this movement is growing yeah. and we need to be very cautious in going forward and i think language can help us do that right absolutely thank you for answering that because people they really wanted to hear this from you they really <laughs> did. it was a very okay. repeated question <laughs> now <clears throat> i know we hit on this a little bit earlier but uh, I did want to mention our God is One has sold, I believe, over 100,000 copies. It may be more than that now, uh, but early interracial oneness Pentecostalism is considered one of the most dynamic scholarly works in the last decade. I read that online last night, by the way. I looked it up. Uh, did you know that it's available... Um, 
almost on all ebook formats. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of that, and it, they released it in uh, in eleven countries. It's been uh, that latest book, Early Interracial, has been a phenomenal. Uh, uh, now, d just to clarify something, Our God is One has sold over 15,000 copies. Okay. But all my books together come to gotcha. 150,000. I got But gotcha. uh, So j just to be clear there. Google sometimes is but, not a dependable <laughs> resource. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the new book, our, uh, my, my doctoral work, is right. interesting because it's both about race, mm -hmm. but uh, race is... Um, it, what the reason race is at the center there is because the movement simply said, you know, the Lord's going to pour His Spirit out on all flesh, and that's what the movement did. And because of that, and it's being simplistic in its faith, and we're not going to have to go back to Nicaea and become super, super uh, intelligent PhD students. They just believe the truth, preached it, and people get the Holy Ghost. They believe Jesus' name, baptism, and uh, so. Right. Yeah. The movement's just been exploding. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. And, and I know that I have had people come up to me countless times and just say, please tell your father, thank you. Thank you for writing. Thank you for researching. Thank you for dedicating himself to, to this. Because uh, for people to see the growth in black and white on paper, uh, it just encourages people to, to no end. So uh, they are so thankful for that, and I am as well. Now, I did want to hit on this. It, it felt like a shame to interview you and not get to talk just a little bit about your travels um, because my entire life, uh, you know, I've you've been to Norway and Paris and goodness, just I don't know how many countries you've been to. Uh, but your your teaching ministry has you know on the oneness of God, baptism in Jesus name. Uh, you're highly sought after to teach in different countries. I know you just preached the Guam General Conference, and that's been probably your most recent trip that I know of. But over the years, what has been your most impacting? trip out of the country uh to go teach the gospel okay well that that's, that's a tough an, question <clears throat> that's an interesting question mm -hmm. uh one of the facets of of my research at uh, wheaton college was the the size of the oneness movement mm -hmm. i had to defend that in the, uh, in front of uh, a team of baptists that the oneness movement was growing faster than uh, any other group any other pentecostal group or evangelical group and I had to present statistics. So in the end, I was able to present that the movement was millions strong mm -hmm. right. and that there were over eight, about, right now I'm at about 800 oneness groups wow. uh, from in every nation of the world. The latest statistics, we have a group called Oneness Studies Institute that uh, keeps advancing these studies and uh, based on original works with my PhD and so on. And so we're right at about, uh, let's just say really close to 34 million Jesus name people that we can point to. We know where they are, what countries they're in. There's way more than that, but that's the number we can prove, let's say. Right. And uh, so having that kind of a, a in interest in, uh, so we're looking here at what is the most uh, yeah. interesting. I think the most interesting, okay, if I had to say that, I mean, I could say it's the Muslim group where they were killing apostolics and God poured the Holy Ghost out and thousands were filled with the Holy Ghost and I met and talked to their leader. I could say that of many, many oneness groups or uh, UPC missionary uh, places, but I'm going to say that my most intriguing and interesting was uh, going to China mm. and finding out that there was a oneness movement in Tibet wow. and meeting the head of the movement because I was it was at a time in my in my ministry when uh, that really impacted me that was I don't know how many years ago I'm gonna say that was about a decade ago and uh, I met this uh, he, he was Chinese. I met him and uh, he had gotten the revelation of the oneness of God and had never met a oneness person. 
Wow. And was a Tibetan monk. Mm. <laughs> and so, and of course he was persecuted and nearly killed. Uh, I interviewed him and I, uh, this was after I published Our God is One. Our God is One opened doors all over the world. Yeah. And uh, so I would say the Tibetan story has been the most impacting and the most interesting, but I could say that about dozens of other so, yeah. places, uh, Spanish works that are growing. The oneness movement is at, at a, I think at a crossroads. We need to continue revival like never before and maintain our faith like never before. And if we do that, uh, since I believe the Lord is coming, I, I think we could see an end time revival that would literally shake the world. Yeah. I believe we could do it. I believe that. I believe that. I've always been fascinated um, by your travels and your research. Now, I almost have my associate's degree, so if you need any expertise, <laughs> oh, good, feel good. free to reach out to me if you need any, any resources. Awesome. But I know, I know that your time is valuable, so I'm going to close with this question. And I've ended uh, all of my recent interviews with this question because uh, I think it's important. Uh, especially when I get a chance to talk to an, an elder or somebody from a different generation. So at NAYC, I know, I know you were able to be there. I'm so glad you could be there. But Jack Cunningham preached on Generation Z, apostolic to the core. And I think a thousand people got the Holy Ghost that night and there were healings and it's just an incredible service. But uh, what does this generation need to work on to make sure that we are apostolic to the core. This generation Z, if we would call it that, yeah. uh, has to go back to the basics. Mm. The revival of the early church, the revival of the early pioneers, early interracial, all generations had to go back to prayer, fasting, and the Bible. Yeah. and obey it and live by it. Holiness is a part of that. And if we stay with the message of Scripture and the power of the Holy Ghost, that's what we saw at NAYC. 37,000 young people, they wouldn't even leave the building. Yeah. They were hungry. They heard the word. They responded. And I see this. I see a great momentum uh, in the apostolic church, and I believe in that it's going to become uh, the end-time revival before I pray. Well, uh, Pastor, I'm so thankful for your time. I, I would ask that you could close us out uh, in prayer and that we could just pray that this will bless somebody. And I know there's a lot of listeners that are going to be very, very excited to, to hear this. Would you do us the honor of closing us out in prayer? Yes, I will. We ask that you would anoint and bless. Let the words, Lord, that go forth and this today especially lord ask for your will to be done and for anointing in the lives of this people and bless what we ask in jesus name jesus. amen well dad i love you thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule the next day john saw jesus coming toward him and said behold the lamb of god takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, 
Study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful.